Excellencies, distinguished guests, I'm very pleased to be with you uh, this morning, and I'd like to convey the greetings of the UAE Foreign Minister, Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed Al Nahyan. He apologized. He was not able to be here uh, himself today due to obligations at the UN General Assembly in New York. He sent his best wishes for productive discussions. This morning's session, Iran, Syria, and Egypt, is a very timely one. Over the past three years, the struggle in Egypt and Syria have gone back and forth as the world's biggest crisis. I believe that, while different, these two countries are linked conceptually by ideas of inclusions. And what it means for the Arab society in 21st centuries to be truly inclusive. I will therefore start with these two countries first, leaving comments on Iran until later. Many have discussed Egypt and Syria in context of fundamental aspects that drove the 20, 2011 revolutions in the first place. These, these include economic stagnations, unemployment, and the lack of opportunities for social involvement in governance. However, I would argue that the issues at the core of the both these countries today is inclusion. The original protesters in Tahrir were led by young liberals who want more power to the participants on their own society. This too is also how Syrian revolutions began with a peaceful call for social participation. However, in both cases, the governments fail to live up the popular demands, while the removal of Mohamed Morsi from the Egyptians' presidency in July was decreed hastily as a coup. Where is more to the story? Morsi made the mistake of seeing his election as a mandate to deny right to those who did not support him. This includes what was shaping up to be a systematic legal corpse on the right of women, Christians, and other minorities. Morsi fundamentally divided Egyptian society along ideology lines in a way that was unhealthy and uncharacterized of Egypt. He systematically introduced a dangerous secretarian element to Egyptian society. The targeting of Christians and the looting and the burning of the churches and aftermath of this arrest is evidence of this divide and conquer approach that he and his followers take. This appeal secretarianism and what fundamentally drove the army to act on behalf of the people on the 3rd of July. Secretarianism is, in many opinion, the single greatest danger in the region. And that is why it provoked the decision to remove Morsi. <clears throat> this is all building to the main point about Egypt which is that is, uh, it's not a lost uh, cause. With the right law and institutions, it can become more inclusive and therefore more stable. It is my view that the constitutional, constitutional committees in a session now has the power to enshrine these values of inclusions 
and anti-secretarianism in law in such a way that they cannot be tempered with. Even at the old box, it is therefore critical at this moment that countries support Egypt through this transition and offer constructive assistance both politically and financially. The military does not want to stay in power forever, and it won't. But by the same token, in order for it to leave, the people must be confident on the ability of the new institutions to protect them. Therefore, rather than condemning Egypt, which only encourage its reiterate from productive international partnership, now it's the time to engage, to offer help and, and advice, and to ensure that the transition proceeds smoothly this is critical not only to Egypt, but to the regional security. This, the, the issue of inclusion is also central in Syrian crisis. The explosions of violence that we have seen over the past two and a half years in Syria is an indicator of the intense fear that people throughout the region have of the zero-sum secretarianism that is rising on the wake of the collapse of so many state institutions. The conflict in Syria, which started out as a peaceful call for democratic participations, has now turned into frantic search for protections. The bottom line in Syria at the moment is that each of the country diverse communities believe that they will be slaughtered if their side does not prevail. This existential perceptions of the threat has created the intensity of the violence we are witnessing today. It is additionally being fed by outside power who reinforce Assad false messages that he is the only one who can protect minority communities, communities from extremism. In fact, he provokes, he provokes extremisms with his narrative. There is simply no chance for functioning multi-ethnic Syrians while Assad remain in power. This is why the issue of Geneva has taken on so much pertinence and is looking to be a top issue on the agenda at the UN General Assembly. Make no mistakes, Geneva means that Assad leaves. Even Russia understand that the mutual consents agree to in the first Geneva declarations mean that the Syrian opposition gets a veto on any final settlements. And this necessarily means that Assad will not be allowed to stay. I'm aware that much has been said lately of the makeup of the oppositions and their commitment to this value and in inclusions that I keep referring to. I can say with a confidence that the Syrian opposition's coalitions and its leaderships are truly committed to a moderation and tolerance. And they recognize extremism for the threat that is it whether it emanates from the regime or from foreign fighters. The reality is that the coalition is the only party in this war that is committed to maintaining a diverse and inclusive Syria. Finally, in terms of Iran, I would like to switch gear a bit. 
whereas Egypt and Syria are fundamentally unword oriented issues marked by their populations, search for an inclusive society. Iran raises outward looking questions on term of its role in the rest of the region. And it's bring to mind issues of continuity in foreign policy, despite domestic changes. Much has been made of the election of Hassan Rouhani as Iran president, with, one, with many hailing him as a moderate. While there have certainly been cosmetics improvements and positive changes in the tune in Iran since his election. Most of these changes are all fundamentally oriented internally in terms of how Iran interacts with its own population. These improvements, therefore, have a little impact on the region. On the contrary, in terms of foreign policy, Iran's core interests and methods remain the same. This is on full display in Syria, where the Iranian Revolution's Guard remain on the ground, fighting and assisting the regime. This aid has turned pivotal battle toward the regime and has changed the tide of the war. Without Iran aid, it's doubtful that Assad would have been able to hold on far as long as he has. The new administration has not changed this. This is why we need to continue to approach Iran with a caution, particularly when it comes to the nuclear issues. Hope for progress is a different from progress itself. And the two should not be confused. And the Rouhani government is truly different from its predecessors. Then let those differences come out in the upcoming round of nuclear negotiations in the form of solid and uh, very viable progress. Otherwise, the international community needs to be prepared to consider the issues of how to respond if Iran continue to believe that it is interest lie in pursuing nuclear technology outside the context of IAEA. Oversight and directly intervening in civil war in the region. To conclude, I've left you with two big concepts to consider when analyzing event in these three consequent countries, inclusions and continuity. I believe that these two concepts can act as lens for examining not just events on these three countries, but in the region and in general. Indeed, in evaluating the stability and potential impact of ongoing political changes in the Arab world, asking, does this make the country more inclusive? Can provide more insight in many cases. Similarly, when analyzing how domestic changes might impact foreign policy, the simple conceptual questions to ask might be, does this actually change the country fundamentals interest? If the answer is no, then one might apply a bit more cautions before finalizing a new investment or repositioning defense forces. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today, and I look forward for further questions and discussion. Thank you very much, sir.